Hi, my name is Eniera Matthews, and I'm the Research Services Librarian for the Douglas and Henry Academic Centers. Black History Month is in February, and Mercy University Libraries is proud to celebrate this month on behalf of our students, faculty, and staff. And today, I'm joined with Dr. Olivia Box, who is the Associate Professor in Educational Leadership here at Mercy University. And today, we'll be discussing the history and experiences of Black students and faculty within the space of education. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Boggs. Thank you, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for asking me. Of course. And my first question is, how have Black people made a space for themselves within um, education, even when enduring Jim Crow and slavery? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it has many parts to it, but I won't belabor it. But um, I guess first I want to emphasize that slavery, we have to remember that slavery is not ancient history, that it actually ha happened in almost modern times, which makes it a, another kind of dilemma for us to, to explain it. It's not something that happened uh, BC, um, but it's, um, you know, there were so many things that were invented during that the era of slavery, the telephone, the telegraph, the um, steam engine, um, the phonograph. And so we realized that um, we have to learn about though that era as uncomfortable as it is so that we won't ever repeat it because it is it is modern, really modern history. So we won't repeat it. Um, and so often we're asked, um, like we have Black History Month, which is wonderful. When I was a child, it was Black History Week. So it's grown from that. But we don't ever want to um, uh, marginalize the story of Africans in America. We don't want to footnote it or um, minimize it because actually the the story of, of uh, this journey is the American story. It's a, it's a part of the fabric of the American story and it needs to be uh, told. But I think to, to be specific to your question, I think um, African-Americans have had to be very tenacious uh, in this journey towards education, very focused, um, actually very mission driven. Um, and it, that has sort of, uh, there's a connection between education and freedom um, during slavery and even to this day. Freedom um, for, for many slaves was a place and in many instances, uh, even now, it's a state of mind that um, something that we can pursue. And education is actually the best vehicle to achieve those things. So um, that's probably my best explanation that um, this idea of education is so connected to opening doors, opening windows, opening space um, that that will allow um, the ancestors of enslaved people to uh, do what Maya Angelou said in that beautiful poem. Um, she said, we are the uh, hope and the dream of the slave. And so that's who we are. And we honor our ancestors by pursuing as much of the educational landscape uh, as we can. My next question is, why are historically Black colleges and universities so important for Black faculty and students? Um, like what should they know about these institutions, even if they don't work at one or attend one? Well, I love that question because I am a, a, an HBCU graduate. I finished um, uh, Hampton University, uh, which is in Hampton, Virginia. There are people here about HBCUs, but then many people don't know what that means. And that's OK, because I could fill every soccer stadium in America with what I don't know. So it's OK. But we, we want to enlighten people about the importance of, uh, of historically black colleges and universities that we um, use the acronym HBCU. Uh, there are 107 in this country, 10 are in the state of Georgia, um, and they date back to 1934, Cheney uh, University, um, and a little later in 1954, uh, Wilberforce University. Now, the interesting little sidebar here, Wilberforce is in Ohio, Cheney is in Pennsylvania, and there's this always this clash between those two colleges as to which one was first. Wilberforce was the first college founded by and for African Africans in America, and um, Cheney was not. But um, I'm not in that battle. Uh, one of my friends did her mother, who died at 103, Dr. Jamie Coleman Williams. It was a proud graduate of Wilberforce, Wilberforce, and she didn't indulge in that argument because she said there's no question that Wilberforce was founded first. But uh, these schools were founded immediately following slavery, and um, they were founded because during slavery, it was against the law to teach slaves to read and write. It was, These were Black 
codes that each of the Confederate states established so that you couldn't teach. Um, um, if you were white and taught a uh, slave to read, you could be fined for $10,000 which is a lot of money today, but at that time it was a tremendous amount of money. And if you were black and you could read and you were caught teaching a fellow slave to read, even if you were free, uh, you could be lashed, beaten, or even worse. So it, this literacy thing was forbidden. Um, and that has that's sort of been a theme. You think, well, why would that be? Why, would, why was it so important to, to not teach slaves to read? Um, and so HBCUs were established um, um, immediately following slavery with the exception of those two schools that I mentioned. And my university, Hampton, uh, at the time it was uh, Hampton uh, Agricultural Normal uh, Institute. And normal schools um, were not just limited to, to HBCUs, but normal schools were really there to te teach teachers, to prepare teachers to teach others. And you can see that at the end of the Civil War, there was a great need to have teachers to teach literacy to 4 million newly freed uh, slaves who were in need of these skills. Most could not read, could not write, not because they were ignorant, because, but because they were denied the chance. So teachers went out and the American Missionary um, Association was the, one of the major sponsors of, of HBCUs. And of course, those colleges evolved into colleges, universities, some are research universities, um, so that they evolved from those schools that were just preparing teachers to teach newly freed slaves to uh, where we are today. Um, I would urge anyone who's watching this, however, to um, look up, there. there's something called the slave narratives, um, and it uh, between 1936 and 1938, over 2,000 um, former slaves, they were still alive at that time, were interviewed, recorded, audio recordings of them by the um, Works Progress Administration, the WPA, which was um, uh, one of uh, Roosevelt's um, uh, agencies. And these recordings are housed at the University of Virginia, but you can get them online. I, I download them and, and use them frequently. And these are the words. These are not um, what people think happened during slavery. These are the actual words of these newly freed slaves. And, um, and they talk about their desire to learn to read and write. And so HBCUs started with that foundation of preparing this ugly underbelly that was created through what one author said, well, referred to slavery as the, the peculiar institution. Um, I think it was William Knapp who, who wrote a, a book about slavery. And, um, and in that, he referred to it as a peculiar institution. Um, and so the, the, these colleges and, and universities now, these 107, are very popular. And interestingly enough, they are growing in popularity. The, their popularity declined for quite a while. And in recent years, for various reasons, um, their enrollment has grown. Students are choosing to go to HBCUs. I chose to go to an HBCU because I knew uh, going to college at 17, Team. I needed all the support and help that I could get because I was the, the if you looked up uh, immature in the dictionary, you'd see me waving. So I knew I needed that support. I also chose to go there because it, it my mother went there, her parents went there. It was, a, it was sort of a family school for us. And um, I was desirous of continuing that tradition. And su subsequent uh, to that, my niece graduated from Hampton and her daughter finished last Last year. So we're, we're Hamptonians. We're, the pirate is the uh, symbol of Hampton, the Hampton pirate, because ha Hampton is on the river, on the water. So we call ourselves pirates. But um, I'm a big advocate of HBCUs. Having said that, uh, it's good for, for students to go to any types of colleges. My subsequent education for, for graduate degrees, uh, I did not go to HBCUs because I was following a, a course of study that I wanted to uh, pursue and found those in uh, two other, two separate universities that worked out pretty well for me. Uh, okay, my next question is, since the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, has it been easier for Black learners to access a quality education? Yeah, okay, that's that's a really good question. And I guess the answer is yes and no. If it's, has it been easier? No, <laughs> and yes. Um, and that's true with any so many things in life. Um, you know, with Brown, the Brown decision was um, um, liberating 
it was um, it had for uh, you know slavery was abolished um, in 1965. And there were uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments helped to solidify rights for these uh, newly freed, freed slaves. But there was such a pushback that uh, Jim Crow laws came into effect. Those were segregation laws that were in effect throughout the South, separate but equal, separate schools, anything public uh, was separate, but anything funded uh, by the state government had to be segregated. And so that was libraries, uh, movie theater, uh, public pools, any anything um, like that was separate but equal. And the language in Brown was that that um, segregation was no longer legal um, and that it had to be removed with all deliberate speed. That was the language in, in that decision. And it was a unanimous decision by the, by the court. Um, Earl Warren was chief justice at the time. Um, and that didn't happen. There was so much pushback uh, from these states. Um, and so it, it didn't happen when we thought it would uh, as quickly as we thought it would, but it happened, which is the good news. So we do, I don't dwell on the fact that there was so much pushback because it, that pushback was eroded, not without a lot of struggle, not without a lot of struggle. So we can't minimize, oh, it was, it, everything was fine. No, it wasn't. But we kept pushing with the help of others you know it's th this the struggle the civil rights struggle involved a number of people from different ethnicities and um i, I think about uh, ruby bridges and you may remember that picture that uh, norman rockwell that iconic picture of this little girl six-year-old girl ruby bridges integrated public schools in uh in uh, louisiana new orleans louisiana with these Four, she was flanked by these four officers protecting this little thing to go to school. I love that symbol of what that means. And so, yes, things have been easier. Um, no, they have not been easier, but with perseverance and tenacity, things have broken through. Um, there was pushback at a number of, of universities even, you know, when Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter integrated the University of Georgia, um, the, the threats of violence erupted and um, Governor Vandiver, I think was the governor at the time, threatened to close the school for a while. Um, and yet now the University of Georgia is open to any number of people. Mercer on the other hand, Mercer University integrated with no problems, with no uh, threats of any sort. Um, and that it's interesting how we don't hear that story and we need to hear that story even more. So um, yeah, Yes and no. Unfortunately, we lean more towards the yes in, in this. Um, so what has your experience been in education, either as a student or as a faculty member? Um, well, I um, didn't go get into education until my graduate degree, uh, graduate programs. I was a math major in college and um, never took an education course. I, I love mathematics. To this day, I like mathematics. And um, and then my second degree is in uh, rehabilitation counseling. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I, I pursued that because there was a great fellowship that I had the opportunity to get money to go to, to the uh, university that I attended and really fell in love with the affective side of life. You know, math is numbers and symbols and, and rehabilitation counseling opened up this window for um, looking more into people and helping people. And that really just sort of changed, was a paradigm shift for me. Um, and I enjoyed that that line. And then my uh, doctorate is in uh, policy studies, um, administration and policy studies. And that's something that I enjoy tremendously. So uh, my experience has been a good one. I um, have never had the sense of isolation that some people will talk about um, because it, uh, that's just not me. But it helped also, I grew up on college campuses. Uh, my parents uh, taught in the AU Center at, uh, at Spelman. And so I was, I was used to academia <clears throat> um, and classrooms and teachers and all that kind of thing. Um, I went to Spelman Nursery School and then I went to uh, Oglethorpe Elementary School, which was a laboratory school connected with Atlanta University. Um, and um, now I, I didn't realize at the time, but now I realize that we were little guinea pigs for the students to test their little teaching theories and all of that on us. But um, I think education is this powerful vehicle uh, that we need to make sure is available and open to all students uh, regardless of race, color, ethnicity, 
Um, and we need to make students want to come to school. You, you think, well, why do they drop out? In the ninth grade, there's this huge dropout in the ninth grade. Uh, why is that? Well, ninth, the ninth grade is when a lot of them turn 16 and they no longer have to go to school. Compulsory school attendance laws are, are, are don't affect them then. But if something exciting is happening in that schoolhouse, you would think they'd want to come. Teachers are teaching their hearts out. I work with teachers in my line of work here. So what is what is going on? And that, that level of research needs to be done to, to go inside the academy and just do a, a just a, a scan of what is what is going on. We're having another issue at this moment with teachers leaving the profession in droves. Um, you may recall that in the fall of this year, many public schools throughout the country couldn't staff their schools. They were having to hire uh, supply teachers because a lot of teachers had quit. We're going into other fields. Um, why? Why is that? Uh, I, we have some, <clears throat> I'm not asking in a vacuum, we have some uh, pretty compelling reasons why people are leaving education. Um, but we need to now go to the next step and see how can we um, stop that uh, bleeding of teachers. And you can't just stop it by saying, don't do that. <laughs> we have to go inside the schoolhouse and, and, and inside the village, frankly. Perhaps we need to expand the number of people who are involved in, in crafting schools and education for children. In, in, in education, we no longer talk, you know, we talk about P12 education, which is first grade through 12th grade, but now we talk about P20, P21, that the seamless um, journey from pre-K through elementary, secondary, and post-secondary education. Um, and how can we make that, that a stronger link? Because when people drop out before they get credentialed, be it a, a, a degree in a college degree or certification in something, when they drop out, there's a tendency there that their lives will, will not be as fulfilling as they would have desired. You know, the average uh, criminal is a, is a dropout. You, you rarely do you know, we're not saying that someone with a PhD can't be a criminal. I'm not saying that at all. But typically, the average criminal is someone who's dropped out of school, who has no uh, skills. And when you don't have skills, then you will, you might turn to a life of crime. Um, once again, everyone who drops out of school is not turning to a life of crime. But we know that this one thing called education that is that is paid for, that's free, the taxes pay for this thing called education, that we, we require children for 10 years to go to participate in this thing. From, and, and each state has a different um, formula for compulsory education, but every state requires it. And if we can't um, capture the imagination um, and the energy and, and fulfill the educational needs of children, in 10 years, we really need to think about what's what's going on. Do we need to do a better job of involving families and communities in this process of churches? Of uh, we, we just kind of, and there are pockets where it, this is very successful. There are pocket, there are communities where uh, I was talking to a gentleman re recently, um, and his school system um, has a 90% um, completion rate. This is a high poverty school system. 90% completion rate, um, which is just unheard of. And for minorities, it's a 95% completion rate. So, you know, why not look and see what's going on in that particular district? And can we duplicate that, replicate that rather in other systems? It can be done, but things are so uh, volatile. I don't mean that in terms of, of, of violence, but just sort of volatile in that it's just hard to get, get Get your hands on what's going on because people are coming and going. Superintendents are leaving, principals are leaving, teachers are leaving. And so HR is constantly hiring new people. And that just doesn't bode well for a stable uh, schoolhouse. My next question is, um, so in many cases, being one of the only or like few Black students or faculty members on campus can be lonely and even scary sometimes. Uh, so what advice do you have for students of faculty who work or attend at predominantly white institutions? Like how would you encourage them to continue their educational journey? Yeah, um, I think staying focused, making sure you um, you have uh, a, a vision in mind as to what it is, you, you, why are you here? 
um, and that's true with, with if you're at an HBCU or <clears throat> a predominantly white university, if you're at a technical college or a community college, it's just important to, to be, even before that first day of class, even before you apply to that school, just have an idea, a vision <clears throat> in mind. You don't want to apply to a college because it has a great football team and um, you're not a football player or you like the way the cheerleaders look. I think that's that's going to be, that's not going to bode well. Um, so you do want to think about what is it that I see myself doing? Because the whole purpose of college is to prepare a person for a career. And um, it's 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 sad when students will apply to a college, get into a college, and find out uh, that their career goal would not be met in through this vehicle. Uh, and so that's probably doing your homework even before you go and remaining focused after you get there. Now, this is advice that I got before I went from my family, and that is stay in touch with your teacher. Don't be intimidated by a teacher. It, you know, you have some teachers who are going to be warm fuzzies and biting and you feel comfortable going to office hours. And you may have some teachers who are more distant um, and we can't control people's personalities. Some people are by nature very engaging and some are uh, a little more um, distant and a little more cold even. But don't let that prevent you from making an appointment. We're required to have office hours. Every university, college, whatever has office hours. And those office hours are designed for primarily for teachers, professors to meet with students. And um, I, I remember in my freshman year, I went to see a, a teacher about a grade. And um, boy, I, you know, the office hours were right there on the door. And I was treated so... Um, coldly, but I stood my ground. You know, I remember this this person never said, sit down, have a seat, um, never said anything welcoming. So I stood up as I'm talking. Um, and I guess I should have said, could I sit or whatever. I'm, I'm Actually, my goal at that point was just to get out of there as quickly as possible because I felt so uncomfortable. But that's a rare kind of uh, situation. Um, the other thing I think is probably as important and that's throughout life. Um, and that, that is don't allow others to define your worth, define who you are. Um, it's easy to succumb and let somebody else, someone you like, you have a you might have a teacher you, that you like and um, or friends, you meet new friends and um, and they you don't want them to define you. You want you to define you. What is it that you are about? What are your values? And, and, and stick to your core values so that that keeps you, once again, I'm going back to what I said earlier, and that is that keeps you focused. You know, you want to stay focused, true to yourself. Sometimes that requires us to actually sit back because many people have never reflected on um, who they are. Many of us go through life never thinking, never doing that self-reflection of who am I? What, what do I, in what do I believe? Um, what, what are my core values? Um, and then it, it helps you just to, to sort of um, move forward in a confident, not arrogant, but um, confident way. Um, as a teacher, I think it's important. Um, I found it to be important to stay on top of your discipline, to, to just stay connected to whatever your field is. And, and most of our fields today are, are really broader than that narrow thing that we think it's about. So that requires us to look around us and see what are the other fields that inform my discipline. Um, and that does require us to read regularly, um, to participate in the discourse, to publish, to do research and publish, to seek grant funding. It's not always easy, but you want to carve that out. That that helps you to stay on top of uh, your professoriate. Um, it's you don't. It's not an ivory tower, but it's helping to your mind to stay focused on what's important in this discipline and how is this discipline helping someone. You you don't want to have. I think this is. I keep saying you don't want to, but I don't want to have a discipline. Um, that's just benefiting me. I'm always thinking, how will this benefit my students? Um, and then the the last thing is be willing to listen to others. Um, sometimes I, I sit in meetings and I really I was reflecting to a colleague uh, just yesterday. I said, you know, I think what we we so often do is when other people are talking, we hear want 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 want, and 
And then, because I'm waiting to get my two cents in. And so we're not really listening or reflecting on others. And that at the end of a meeting, we're exhausted and very little has uh, taken place. And that might be our e egos, I don't know. But um, just to, to be willing to listen to others, we can learn and uh, grow from uh, others. Um, we think we, we, we get, um, we arrive at a certain position and think we know it all. And that's the uh, furthest thing from the truth. Okay, so I have one last question. Um, so my university library has access to all kinds of resources. And based on this discussion, um, I recommend a journal article by uh, Robert Bruce Slater titled The Blacks Who First Attended, Who First Entered the World of White Higher Education. Uh, what other resources do you recommend that students, faculty, and staff can like use or check out to learn more about uh, Black people within the space of education? Okay. Well, I, you thank you for that question because I you see I'm sitting in front of some some of uh, some of my books, so you have to cut me off because there's so many so many things to recommend and things are coming out regularly. People are publishing regularly. It's hard sometimes to keep up. But Mercer University Library, I'm telling you the truth. I have yet to ever reach out to Mercer University Library and and not get a, an immediate response and help. So um, shout out to you and Kim Eccles and all of your staff for the beautiful work that you do. Um, I tease um, librarians that I know because if you ask a librarian a question, you're going to get your answer and more. And that's a good thing. But to answer your question, so I did pull out some, some books that I thought are important. Um, let's see. I, I'm not going to do this forever, but this one is called Africans in America, and it's a compendium to a, um, a PBS series, but it's written by, Ch I, can you see that? Is, it, is there a glare? Yeah. So that's one that I, that I think is, a, is really important. And this um, is, if you, in my opinion, if you can only read one book, this should be it. <laughs> this is The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. Fanon was an Algerian psychiatrist um, and Algeria was colonized by the French. So he was, um, he was a native African. He um, studied in France and went to medical school and just really captures this, this whole concept of colonization um, throughout Africa, throughout the diaspora, the diaspora really, and, um, and the um, mid-Atlantic slave trade. So this is a, another one I recommend. And this is Paolo Freire's great book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Freire is a, um, was a um, Brazilian scholar, teacher. Um, and this is just a really, really good book. And these books just explain in a very, uh, to me, simple way, but very profound way of uh, things that we need to know about um, colonization and enslavement. And this is a classic, The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Now Carter Woodson, Dr. Woodson uh, is a Harvard graduate, uh, got his PhD at Harvard. He's considered to be the father of black uh, history. And um, his this book is such, um, it's iconic really. Um, so it's, it's, you can see it's not, not long, um, it's not thick, but it's just what, something that you really do want to read. Um, uh, this is a more recent one, however. So The Miseducation of the Negro came out in, the, in 1930, I think. And this one came out in 1920, uh, 2021, rather. And this is called How the Word is Passed by uh, Clint um, Smith who is a professor at Harvard, a young professor at Harvard. So this is the other one. And I think, did I get everything? Oh, um, this book is rather recent also. This is um, um, Isabel Wilkerson, and it's entitled The Warmth of Other Suns. This one is is pretty thick, but it's, it's a good read, well-researched. So those are the ones um, that, I, that I kind of recommend. And I want to, this picture here, I don't know if you can see this picture. This is my great-grandmother. My grandmother's grandmother, 
and her name was Ann Payne. She was a slave. She had 10 children and my grandmother was the youngest. And um, she did not learn to read or write. She um, was um, married to Nathan Payne. They were allowed to marry and he was a blacksmith and she raised her children. So I, I always think about her. And I've carried this picture with me to college when I pursued my master's, when I pursued my doctorate. And when Maya Angelou came out with that poem that I referenced earlier, that we are the hope and the dream of the slave, I always think about my great grandmother, Anne Payne, and um, her children and her children's children, um, hopefully um, did her honor for what she had to endure. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that about your family. <laughs> Um, so that was my last question. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about Mercy University Libraries, you can visit us at libraries.mercy.edu. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed speaking with you today.